We, the Center for Global Development, we're a group that try and see how we can make the international system that supports global development work more effectively. How do we finance infrastructure in the poorest parts of the world? How do we increase productivity in agriculture? What kind of policy brings out the best outcomes? What CGD is about is you can ask those difficult questions that people refuse to ask and actually find solutions. We're thinking about how climate change will impact migration patterns, how that will in turn have impacts on people's health. It's challenging to be able to align budget with ambitious programmatic goals, but it can be done. If you can help to make things a little bit better, that's a good way to spend your time. Okay, great. Good morning and welcome to the Center for Global Development. We're here today to discuss a new piece of work by Rose Crozier, who's a former policy fellow and, an, and now a non-resident fellow on how low and middle income countries can develop better policies uh, to access and use satellites and other space-based technologies to drive prosperity and well-being. That's what we're about here at CGD. So satellite-derived technologies underpin almost everything. Uh, ever, transportation, power grids, banking, weather and climate data, and of course, communications, broadband, broadcast, backhaul services, just all the basic infrastructure on which we build our lives these days. But too often, low and middle income countries are not full participants and are not able to use geospatial and navigational data directly or to establish their own sensing, storage, sharing, processing, analysis, and production capabilities. And that's what Rose's work is all about. We're really excited to have her launch this today. And we'd like to thank the Secure World Foundation for their support and review of this handbook. And we're really pleased to welcome Crystal Azelton, who's the Director of Space Application Programs at SWF here to CGD today. So thanks to all of you for joining this launch. And Crystal, over to you. Thanks. All right, well thank you very much, Amanda. Um, as many of you know in the audience, I recognize some familiar faces. Secure World is a nonprofit that does the space side of this equation. We're interested in making sure that the space environment is safe, secure, peaceful, and usable in the long term. And one of the things we like to say is that if you're gonna tell people they have to behave in space, you have to tell them why. And, and that's why when Rose approached us, about you know, do we have this possibility of working together for these complementary resources, we're very interested in that. Secure World, in fact, puts out a book called The Handbook for New Space Actors, which is really meant to say, here's the guidelines and here's what you need to know about space law, about national space policy, and about on-orbit operations. You know, here's kind of the standard of what's considered good practice in space so that we can actually receive these benefits on Earth. But we often get asked, okay, well, can you tell me more details? Can you give me more information? Can you tell me what I should do in my country or at my university developing a small satellite? And we're like, uh, yeah, sorry, not, not the job that we, we signed up to do in this particular case. And so when Rose approached us um, to, to take a look at what she was putting together, we saw it as, as another great resource to be put out into the world um, for you know, I like to say countries, but I mean really around the world, those who are actually developing space programs takes on a number of roles. And so, you know, as Secure World's director who wrote the foreword for the book said, becoming a space capable nation is a complex multi-year endeavor that re requires building coalitions across a wide spectrum of actors from government, industry, and civil society. It is not something that just happens in a flash overnight. Um, and it takes a lot of different and interesting paths. And so we see this resource as, as an incredible um, offering to say, here are some more things to think about. Here are some considerations. Here's what some of the best research says. Here are other resources that you, you can reference. And so I'm excited here today to, to be part of this book launch, to talk about some of the ideas uh, that are explored uh, within this. And as those of you who are interested, uh, we also want to continue this partnership, both with the Center for Global Development, but with all of our other partners. Um, and as you get more interested in space capabilities, our plug is always going to be don't forget about space sustainability, because sustainability on Earth is very much tied to sustainability in space and vice versa. So if you're interested in pursuing those, I'd invite you to check out what Secure World is doing. We have our upcoming Summit for Space Sustainability in New York and a variety of other resources that are extremely complementary to what we're here to discuss today. So thank you very much. Yes. 
<laughs> Good morning. I am so thrilled to be here today. Um, I hope I have slides. Slides. Hmm. Ah, oh, great. Okay. And a clicker to change the slides. Well, I'll just say out loud um, when to change slides, and we'll just go with that. Um, so. I just want to give a little background for this work. Um, I originally came from the Air Force. I did 20 years in the Air Force, and I started out first in space operations, which was a foundation um, obviously useful in this work because we got into details about what can satellites do, who launches them, what do you do when there's a problem in orbit, um, and, and what kind of services are actually used by real human beings on the ground. From there, I moved on to doing uh, military diplomacy, where I was doing a lot of uh, capability and capacity building on things like maritime security or uh, border security or disaster preparedness and response. I was in West Africa for Ebola, and it was uh, eye-opening about how many challenges we had to face at the same time, but also how creative people were being in leveraging space capabilities to address that. A great example is in Togo, where Togo used uh, geofencing to and certain algorithms to identify people who were particularly um, in difficult situations and then directed funds to them you know, most directly using a combination of capabilities to include uh, space, uh, the space segment of communications, to include remote sensing data, to include GPS. So uh, those kind of opportunities, I think, are, are there and they're waiting for countries to take better advantage of them. So this foundation, this, this work is really meant to be an on-ramp for that scenario, for countries that want to make use of space as a tool, but are trying to figure out a way to do it efficiently, efficiently a way to balance it with so many other priorities that they have from, from day to day. So you know, I know I'm, I'm focused on talking to planners. I'm talking to that very capable person who's been told, hey, make this more accessible to our government, to our people, but they may not have a big space background. They didn't have the advantage of working at Vandenberg for three years and thinking about space every single day. So I'm planning, this, this effort really breaks it out into three pieces. Very simply, why, you know, why would we want to do this? Because you've got to communicate to the people and to policymakers and to lots of other people without a space background about why space is useful or important. Be specific about what we're trying to do. You know? And I'm not talking about necessarily launching a satellite. That can be part of a program, but really it's about all of the structure that makes best use of existing space infrastructure first. And then if you're going to invest in you know, a satellite or upstream space capabilities, that you do it in a way that you get the most out of those dollars, the most out of that effort. And the last piece, really, how to do it. So this is where I get to leverage all that program design and development work I did and all sorts of capability capacity building subjects where you're still dealing with complex systems. And if you just apply those principles, which are actually well established, you know, to space, you can have a decent way to approach this in, in a logical and methodical manner. So that, that's the main goal of, of this handbook. So, you know, this, uh, I, probably about a third of this book is all about why. I have a lot of reasons why, but I tried to boil it down to some things that, that I hope you'd walk away with today. The first off is we have enormous resources already in orbit today. You know, the most basic is the global national satellite systems uh, like GPS, but there's more than one constellation and they're providing position navigation and timing free to the world, <laughs> to every single person. It's really baked into daily life for most people on the planet one way or another. And this is billions of dollars worth of capability, but it's not the only constellation that is out there doing this kind of work. You know, this is the World Meteorological Organization's uh, uh, collection of satellites, 525 satellites that are collecting data that are focused on weather and climate. And these countries, you know, Russia, China, the United States, Europe, we're sharing this data in a really um, you know, heartwarming way, honestly, to get information to humanity so people can make smart decisions about planting their crops or dealing with uh, disasters, any number of things that can be used for this data. And this is not the only type of data that's being used from remote sensing satellites. There's a lot of um, options, and every day it's, it's increasing. Um, and so how do we understand what is out there and how do we start applying it to um, ah, okay. <laughs> uh, how do we start applying it to um, uh, real problems? 
So uh, the third major category is the space segment of telecommunications. So only about 5% of internet uh, data is being transferred via satellites, but it's a really important 5%. You know? uh, and also it has uh, some unique capabilities, and that is particularly to be able to reach those remote or difficult locations where you know, fiber is not reasonable to, to, to reach. You know, it just, we, we have done a lot of development work, uh, as I'm sure um, we'll talk about later, in extending uh, data infrastructure to try to reach every human being, but it's very costly if you're talking about laying optical fiber to very remote locations. But there is a possible business case there to do that using satellites. And particularly new space is opening up some exciting opportunities in, in that realm. So I've been talking about how space uh, underpins and extends existing infrastructure. Um, Amanda had earlier talked about all of the pieces of infrastructure it touches. Um, but I'd also say, uh, um, a, you know, related to this communications piece, how it extends it to, to sort of new, uh, new sets of people, opening up new markets, um, it's, it's got a lot of, a lot of potential, um, not only for infrastructure, but to be a base to grow the economy further, create new types of businesses, new types of connections, and generally to grow the, the global economy. Um, and, and I'd say, you know, for sustainable development goals, it's also giving us some new options. You know, the combination of capabilities, like mentioned in Togo, uh, are, are there. And we need people in place to localize these capabilities and apply it to problems that are closest to, to their interests and concerns. I'd also like to note, developing a space capability provides a really important tangible independence. So some equality at the table. If they're sitting at the table and considering space, you need somebody who's an internal advocate who can say, this technology makes sense over this technology, and um, here's a, a reasonable path to do that, who can negotiate um, with you know, said country's interests in mind. So this is just an example um, on the communications front. We had previously talked about um, you know, how much uh, GPS is used and how much uh, remote sensing data is used. And I'd say kind of the new and rapidly expanding arena is uh, in, uh, telecommunications infrastructure in general. And this is really referencing a piece I did last year when I was exploring this topic. And the main point is the cost of access to space-based uh, information is, is dropping rapidly. And it's on trajectory to continue to go down. We've got a long ways to go before it's really affordable to most people but it's moving in the right direction. And so it's time for us as a development community to think about how to leverage that uh, in a smart way. Um, and you know, so we're talking constantly about how to narrow the digital gap. This is one potential tool in the toolbox to move in that direction. And there's also some, some challenges too. I mean, if you have increased connectivity, there's going to be potentially associated upheaval or social change associated with that. So technology again and, and uh, the social world and development world are all overlapping and need to be thought about. And then I'd also like to touch on the space sector value chain. And I've done this in of putting a lot of text on this slide, so please forgive me. <laughs> um, I stole it straight from, the, straight from the handbook. But the main point is there is a lot of points of entry for all levels of capability. On the far, uh, far left side, you know, uh, localization of space capabilities, knowledge creation, um, you know, developing uh, uh, auxiliary industries to support uh, the space industry in general, being a supplier of all sorts of materials. These are all things that don't require NASA to exist in your country. Mm -hmm. And then as you progress across uh, the space value chain, you know, you can get into um, upstream, midstream, and downstream operations. But another early entry point is that value added applications where you can take this existing data, the existing space capabilities, and apply them to your economy, your opportunities that are, that are local. So, um, so I've touched, I've touched briefly on, on why, but I have to say, you know, even the most advanced technology in the world left Luke Skywalker in a swamp because he did not have a good foundation to launch from, right? So I'm all about uh, how, to, how to create pragmatically a, a useful foundation to spur all sorts of activity. And this I would call foundational space capabilities. So the goal here, would be have a space organization in a country that can do these four things generally. The first is that consultation and localization role where they're at the table and able to help translate these theoretical capabilities to something real on the ground. They're able to advise the Ministry of Education about how to reach you know, remote villages. They're able to have a conversation during 
disaster management and be able to leverage existing um, you know, charters and capabilities that may be able to lend support to a particular case. Um, and also have a conversation about when space is not necessarily the right answer. You know, maybe uh, uh, UAVs or maybe drones are the best answer. Maybe a ground survey is, is the right answer and just needs to be considered as one of many options. Also, uh, for coordination, you know, you, you have many entities that have space capability. It may be um, a uh, data scientist sitting in a university uh, in your capital. It may be in your military, there's someone who's using GPS and developing maps. There may be someone who is uh, trying to reach remote villages and extend um, you know, communication in some capacity. These are, these are um, reservoirs of, of capability that could be tapped if there was a kind of centralized um, uh, bridging function, and that, I would argue, is, is the government's job to do that. Um, also, it's all about um, spurring complementary activity. So if you need manpower to run a space program, then probably you know, encouraging your academic sector to get into this is, is a reasonable path to go. Um, if you have uh, you know, a space a civil society function of some sort, enthusiasts, well, you've now got users and thinkers who are interested in moving these capabilities forward. Um, the private sector is always interested in, in, in taking advantage of business opportunities. So you know, spurring that forward through um, offering uh, contracts or incentives of some sort to build out that, that piece is, is a great way to move forward. And then also internally with the government, just coordinating activity, for example, if you uh, want to purchase remote sensing data to support an effort, maybe make sure that contract is open so multiple agencies, multiple ministries can access that data and it's an efficient use of, of government funds. So there's a role for each of these and there's a coordination piece to that, which brings me to management. Um, I'm really a big fan of uh, deliberate, deliberate uh, incremental and ongoing work. And you need somebody who's the captain of the ship who is essentially pulling together resources, talking to um, all of these uh, uh, sectors and kind of focusing efforts so you get the most out of what is being put into it. And the last part, as, as Crystal was talking about, there is a role, there is an interest in every country, no matter how advanced your space capability is, to maintain a good, safe, and regulated uh, space environment so we can continue to benefit from all of that existing space infrastructure that is there, and also that we have room for new entries that are, that are starting to join the spacefaring community. Uh, and now I'll get a little bit more into, into how, and I'm aware I've only got a few minutes, so I'll try to be succinct here. <laughs> I basically break it up into two pieces, saying the foundation here, uh, understanding what you have, and, and the being deliberate about building and you know, working toward establishing these foundational space capabilities gives you options. And, if you so choose to move into doing upstream or you know, midstream or downstream uh, activity, then you've got something to build on and you can concentrate your uh, domestic effort on those things that are most important to you and then perhaps use space as a service or reach out for cooperation or collaboration or free resources to do the other stuff that, that you, you don't necessarily have as high of interest. So you really can get your, you know, eat your cake and, and, and have it too, so to speak. Uh, and it just requires, again, sort of deliberate planning. How you organize this, there's, there's no one true way to organize a space capability. Uh, a space office can really consist of an advisor who is there, again, able to do that localization and, and uh, advising role and doing some of this coordination and management role. It doesn't have to be a huge footprint. You, know, you can grow that to a bureau or an office and many countries opt to do this, and sometimes they specialize, maybe go focus specifically on uh, remote sensing data versus everything, and that is a perfectly legitimate way to deliberately and sustainably grow a capability. Or you can invest uh, when ready in having a large agency, though an agency tends to be also more outward facing and tends to do more space activity directly versus a uh, coordinating role, but they also do that. There's a lot of different ways countries have organized themselves, um, sometimes, uh, uh, a country may have uh, a very strong civil society presence, like Ecuador, for example, has um, a space organization that does a lot of functions that 
uh, maybe a traditional uh, you know, national space agency may do. Um, and that is, that is great, so that is fine. We also have countries that have either a very civilian or sort of military-fronted uh, uh, space organization. The United States has NASA and the Space Force, but other countries may have a blended organization. Kenya, for example, has military officers who are in leadership positions in the Kenya Space Agency, and that works to achieve their goals. Um, there's also uh, instances where countries have opted to do a public-private type relationship where they outsource, so to speak, some of these roles and endorse them to speak on behalf of the government. It is also a way to capture capability and move forward. But in all these cases, it's deliberate and it's sustainable, mostly, <laughs> one would hope. Um, a lot of uh, ways to organize, of course, various org charts. My main point here is it doesn't have to be NASA. There's a lot of different places you can house a space office, and all of these have their pros and cons, and I talk about that in more detail in, in the handbook. And you know, so I talked earlier about how space is a tool. Space is like a lot of other complex systems. And really, this is probably a pretty familiar graphic to anyone who's been doing capability and capacity building or any kind of program design or program management. You have to start somewhere. You have to plan what you want, build a team, and then you know, evaluate and understand what is needed, then design or adapt or design a program that fits those priorities, and then you action it, you monitor what you've done, and you, you probably retool it uh, and, and move forward. And the, the challenge is you know, no one knows everything there is to know about what a space program needs to be or has to be or how it's going to function until they're in the middle of creating it or doing it. And there, you have to understand uh, that it needs a degree of flexibility moving forward to be um, a, a strong program. It's a sign of strength, not weakness, that it would adapt over time. And also just to set expectations. Um, so in this chart here, uh, I have this blue line of sort of like ideal progression you know, of capability. But the reality is, you know, it's going to it's going to flow. It's going to give and take, and that is totally normal for any type of complex system. Um, but you can manage that. And if you have a program manager who is there to catch the tail end of a project and make sure that they're able to focus funds and resources into that next thing to keep the keep the momentum going forward, then it's you, you've got a, a reasonable um, progressive program, and you don't risk necessarily losing your manpower, which is often a, a common trap for uh, for new programs. And uh, here in a bigger picture, just the various ways that a, a space program can move forward, move the growth of their space ecosystem. You know, for example, with uh, uh, you know, a government can seek assistance or support uh, for their program, you know, often just referred to as institutional assistance. Um, they can directly support the space activities by you know, uh, forming projects or encouraging projects or funding projects to move forward. Um, they can uh, advise end, your end users uh, of all sorts on uh, how to, you know, available capabilities. They can expose um, uh, sectors of the community who may not have been using space capabilities in the past. They can encourage training. And then, of course, all of this is moving toward uh, incentives and investment in sort of other major sectors through academia, maybe through scholarships, through private sector, maybe through contracts, civil society, uh, through giving them a platform to talk about why space is important, right? And ideally, you're really supporting a positive feedback loop. Uh, and then, you know, options for funding and advising. This is, uh, uh, there's so many, so many possibilities. Many countries uh, look to bilateral cooperation, you know, so it may be a large partner like the United States or China. It may be through uh, many, many range of countries uh, uh, other than US and China that are interested in partnerships. And uh, there's many countries that are looking toward leveraging uh, multilateral or regional efforts. So for example, the Africa Space Agency has just been stood up. Uh, South America is also working on their own agency. The European Space Agency is an outstanding example of a successful grouping of countries that are sharing resources in order to achieve space goals. So these are all uh, fantastic options. Um, you know, increasingly, too, uh, um, development finance institutions and, um, you know, private sector investment are getting into space. And these are, these are interesting and, and useful um, contributions. I think um, it's sort of new for many uh, organizations, uh, maybe not as much for the World Bank, but maybe for the Africa Development Bank or the Asia Development Bank, having a space uh, portfolio is a, an emerging area. You know, and there's also uh, a lot of civil society organizations like the Spear World Foundation, like the Space Foundation, and Val Sami is going to be joining us soon, and he's a founder of the Africa Space Leadership Institute that's also doing similar work in supporting governments 
uh, understand how to leverage space best and how to incorporate into their uh, toolbox. So some closing thoughts. Um, essentially, countries with the space program are more prepared to absorb and magnify their benefits for the good of their economy and society. Um, additionally, space, foundational space uh, capabilities in particular are a good foundation where a nation can accelerate its progress rather than just let it be a sort of organic um, evolution. All right, so thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate uh, this audience, and I really lo I look forward to, I guess, our panel. We're gonna follow up next. And I will be moderating this panel of uh, great people talking about space. Um, I, 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 I'll let the panelists introduce themselves when they when they uh, respond to my, my queries. But I, to, to start off, somewhere in northern Mali, there was this um, weather station that had collected data for decades, and then that part of the country was overrun by insurgents. And since then, there has been no data collected from there. Um, what space-based capabilities allow us to do is obviate the need of building land-based resources that need to be manned physically and provide the same data, same quality that we like right now in the Great Lakes region. There's been significant floods. There are direct applications for this to the lives of people on the continent. So this is an important conversation for us to have. So I will start with, is Val available? I don't see him. So, uh, we will start with uh, Alex. Now, Rose has laid this out, and one of the first things that countries, especially low-income countries, face would be the question of, you know, how do we pay for this? Oh, Val's here. Do you mind if we go to Val? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Val. Hi, Gailey. Are outstanding. Um, so the, the, I, I, the same question I'll pose to you is, you know, what do you think uh, we've just heard Rose talk about all the amazing things that we can get from, from space. But what do you think are the greatest challenges or at least opportunities for countries that are looking to establish their own space programs? Thanks, Gary. Just to start off by uh, congratulating Rose on the incredible handbook. I think it's going to be extremely useful uh, in the times to come. Uh, maybe just to answer the question, I think the, in terms of building space ecosystems, uh, this is now my third assignment, having worked in South Africa, Africa, and now of uh, Saudi Arabia, which I think is the probably the biggest growth potential that's coming through in terms of the global space economy. Um, there's three sort of phases in terms of building a sustainable ecosystem. The one is the policy framing. Um, essentially, what Rose has covered, why we need a space program. It's not a me too strategy. And how do we link it to government priorities in terms of socioeconomic development? Um, and that's the key in terms of the building a sustainable ecosystem. And then also looking at what are the policy level interventions. So looking at it from an ecosystem point of view is essentially where the opportunity lies. But the second aspect is in terms of the due process one needs to follow once you've outlined the policy aspects in terms of the boundary conditions that you want to create for your space ecosystem system. So I've seen in many instances where agencies are established without a strategy even being in place. Uh, and normally we know structure follows strategy. I've also seen, you know, where countries are building satellites without even having an implementation plan. Mm -hmm. And that brings me to the third aspect is in terms of what is the unit of analysis when you're looking at building a sustainable space program. It's not a satellite segment. It's not given the space agency. It's actually the space ecosystem. So we have to have an innate understanding of what an ecosystem looks like. And I think Rose has eloquently captured that in the handbook. So the process aspect uh, is one of the key elements, uh, and there's sometimes a bottleneck, uh, because some countries don't have the in-house capabilities or capacity to develop the policy frames and understand the due processes that needs to follow. And that's where the African Space Leadership Institute comes into play where we're building this capacity in Africa. 
And I think the third aspect is where the actual implementation starts to happen. And there's a number of prerequisites, which uh, leads me to the challenges aspect of the question. Uh, the very high level, and I think Rose captured this as well, do you need government support, political support? Without that, I don't think you're going to have much success in terms of building sustainable ecosystem. Um, you also need, and it goes hand in glove with the political uh, support, is the financials uh, to support a viable space ecosystem. It's not necessarily a singular event. It's a, it's a long-term commitment that you're looking at, um, decades that we are talking about. You also need the requisite infrastructure. So you've got to invest in terms of the capex that's required. You've got to look at the human capital pipeline in terms of the warm bodies that's going to be working in the ecosystem. And then Rose also captured the regulatory requirements. What is the enabling environment that we need to have in the ecosystem? But there are certain opportunities that we can also leverage in terms of making the ecosystem sustainable, and that's bringing in the industry aboard. Uh, my previous experience in South Africa, where we, as an agency, uh, promulgated the establishment of an industry forum, and that brought quite a nice synergy between the agency and the industry because the agency has a listening post through the industry forum. Even with trade delegations, you don't promote one or two companies, but an entire ecosystem. And so space industry bodies have a huge role to play in the ecosystem. Universities, in terms of building the human capital pipeline, where the R&D happens, where the innovation aspect happens. Uh, so that's a very important element of the ecosystem as well that you need to capture. And then the R&D labs, whether it's private sector, public sector, because remember, the space ecosystem is also subsystem within the broader science and tech um, ecosystem. And that understanding is sometimes missing where space ecosystems are built in isolation of the broader science ecosystem. Mm. And then I think Rose also captured how do we leverage on the international partnerships? And that's the opportunities as well in terms of knowledge transfer, technology transfer. Mm. And by the way, international partnerships should not be viewed as donor recipient relationships, which is unfortunate in many countries. It's actually there to look at mutual benefits on both sides of the fence. So let me stop there. I've got much more to say uh, so that we can spread ourselves amongst the panel. Well, thank thanks, you. Thanks, Thank, thank, thank thanks, you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Val. And, and, and I'll follow up with, with you, um, Alex. You know, that multilateral um, financing institutions, they don't just give grants and loans. They sometimes provide policy advice uh, to countries. So the combination of this, I guess the question then is, you know, financial, uh, multilateral financial institutions like the World Bank, uh, African Development Bank, how can they uh, support countries looking to start um, space programs and, and build space capabilities? Thanks for your question. So indeed, um, there is a few organizations out there that really take care, I would say, of the regulation part or the policy part. Um, the development finance institutions such as the World Bank and international financial institutions really try, and, and that links to the previous intervention, to push an ecosystem okay. and, and, and the construction of an ecosystem in those countries. However, it's true that still in those institutions, the bulk of the funding and, and the support goes through lending operations and financing. Mm -hmm. What that means is that you will need to find the right economic arguments, because if I'm doing a loan, it needs to be repaid, and I want something that has a certain return on investment, not only for the World Bank, because the World Bank uses reduced trade, but for the person that is going actually to take the loan. Mm. And those economic arguments need to be built for every application. You do not take a loan to build space capabilities, but you take a loan because you want to inform your agricultural policy by using crop mapping and, and monitoring of crop yields. And for this, you will need to build space capabilities and earth observation capabilities. Mm. So that's how mainly it's been approached. That's an example on agriculture. There are others on, on marine environment, on urban development, on energy, on resilience, on disasters, on all of those different sectors. And for each of them, you will need to make the economic arguments and uh, the economic return on the potential investment. So in order really to tackle this, um, we've been using kind of a framework which we can see as five A's. Uh, there is first the availability and accessibility of Earth observation data. And this has mainly been taken care of by big players such as ESA, NASA, JAXA, and the market itself with a huge inflow of Earth observation and raw imagery that has, that has been happening over the last decades. But now it's not only about having this data available, but really accepting 
I mean, being aware of it, accepting it, and adopting it. And that's really where development finance institutions have been working together with space agencies to really achieve this, this last mile, which is really about the adoption of those, of those technologies. And in order to do this, what essentially international financial, financial institutions have been focusing, focusing on are, are, is, has been about building capacity, mm -hmm. building those ecosystems and building capacity. So it has been first about creating the right institutions, supporting the creation of, of the institutions that will be the key entry points and the kind of the coordinators of the strategies. But more than that now, it's also about building the ecosystem itself because the existence only of those institutions does not, does not ensure that there will be the ecosystem to ingest, uh, tr analyze, and kind of translate those data and, and, and those inputs in really uh, decision, uh, decisions on the ground. So to give a, a quick example of a project that we've been working on, mm. um, I would take the project that's called the Residence Academy, which in its second phase might be rebranded actually Digital Earth Academies. And this project, more than training a few people in a unit, within a uh, department of the government over a specific agency is really about training generations of Earth observation and space savvy people. So it's about working with universities, about working with companies, about working with the government, which again comes back to the coordination between the institutions and the ecosystem part in order to build this ecosystem locally and then support potentially some of those people in, in, in creating companies and, and, and startups that will really push this ecosystem forward and the use of those technologies to release the impact that we should have and to, that those technologies should have on policy making and, and locally on any sectors uh, of the economy. Mm. I just want well, just quickly, and why is it important then that besides governments, there should be the voices of say civil society and non-government voices? What's that, sorry? Why the, the importance of non-government voices in the space sector? Sure, I mean, I think it, it's, it, it comes back to the, to the coordination, which is that you need all parts of the economy mm. to use this data. And in the end, you know, the, you need this intermediary layer because most of the players that are going to be using space capabilities and space data not really care that it comes from space. Mm. They just care that it improves their decision uh, making and processes. And if you do not have this ecosystem that really translates those assets inputs and data into some information that you can take decision on, it will be really complicated really to release, release the potential and impact of this technology. So. Makes sense, thank you. And to our online audience, I should have told you this when I started, you can send us questions, uh, hashtag CGD Talks, you can send us questions on um, uh, YouTube, and you can send us uh, events at CGD cgdev.org. So please send, send in your questions and then I will, I will turn to you. Uh, uh, Crystal, um, uh, Starlink, I think when it's done, will have thousands of satellites in space. And um, I read that somewhere in Europe, they're trying to do something that's similar to Starlink, and China is intending to do something similar to Starlink, ensuring then that you know, space and the use of space is inclusive, so it's not just the biggest players who are dominating this is important. So could you talk to us a bit about why all of this stuff comes together in terms of ensuring that it's sustainable use and that it's inclusive. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the most important things is that as we expand the use of space, you know, what used to be traditionally a military domain become, has become a civil domain and is now very much a commercial domain, which is incredibly exciting. We're seeing all of these new use cases. We're seeing new technologies develop. But we do have to think about the environment. It is a fragile environment which already has certain issues and is only going to continue to develop those mm. as we expand the use of space. And so one of our goals absolutely has to be to ensure the ability to protect and maintain a sustainable space environment without disadvantaging new users. Because mm. that's simply one, unfair, but two, it also stifles innovation. Um, you know, just because you're an emerging space nation or a star small startup doesn't mean that what you're trying to do in space is any less exciting, legitimate, or innovative than something that's been going on for a longer period of time. So we absolutely believe in the principles of sustainable space but to be done in a way um, that, that allows for everyone to continue to do that. And, and there's a lot of answers to, you know, I get asked a lot, you know, what's the solution here? And, mm. and I think people expect it's one thing, you know, it's we're going to do this or we're going to do that. And, and the reality is it's everything. Mm. It's, it's governments taking on the role of regulator and encourager of industry and doing that in a way 
that is responsible and vigilant in making sure that we have the correct regulatory practices in place. It's commercial industry taking on and under and understanding. I mean, this is their business cases. Like, you know, we, we can talk about very large constellations, and of course, there are concerns there. But at the same time, um, all of these companies would like to make money, mm. so so they're very aware of these problems. And and it doesn't mean that we've got all the answers yet. But there is very much this idea of commercial-led best practice. So not everything has to come down from governments. A lot of it is going to come from the companies and the actors themselves. Um, when we're talking about academic institutions and small satellites, being aware of the requirements and understanding them and building to that capacity is going to be part of it. But so is technology. I mean, there's a huge um, growth industry right now in trying to actually address some of the, especially on the debris side, but also on the space situational awareness side. Because in some ways, we can anybody can look up and we understand the problems in the environment, but it's not that simple. And then there's still a lot of gaps from a space situational awareness side. And so we're seeing more governments and more industry really try to tackle that problem. And so the answer is it's going to be this huge variety of things that are all going to have to kind of move in lockstep as we all move forward to figure out what makes the most sense. And, and if anything, we need to continue to expand international forum to be able to try to address this challenge. Mm. So right now, many of the places that we do have to discuss these issues, particularly um, between nation states, are a little bit dominated by, by certain um, you know, long-standing space use, but we've seen that change over time. Mm. We need to continue um, to encourage and to make sure that emerging space nations have the same kind of seat at the table, whether it's at the ITU when we're talking about spectrum, when it's at the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, where we're discussing long-term sustainability guidelines, or in other forum where space is just as important. We also need to think about the commercial side of it. Um, in many um, emerging space nations, you know, the rise in their own commercial industry is very much something they're trying to encourage. In fact, some, as, as Rose Com talks about in her book, that's their entire strategy. I mean, there are places where the equivalent of a space agency lives within an investments in, in, in economic division. It has nothing to do with science and technology. I mean, it does, mm -hmm. but that isn't actually always the goal. It depends on the country. And so in those cases, we need to find methods and paths for everyone in the space industry to have a role. And that goes all the way to what um, Alex was saying about end users as well. We, we can't forget the important role uh, if you again, if you want good policies, whether it's investment in space, whether it's trying to address space sustainability, you you really have to be presenting policymakers and to a certain extent even the public these days with those stories and the understanding. And you need to be making sure that you're making the most effective and efficient use of space as possible. And so thinking about that outreach element as well um, is going to be really important in those conversations. Thank you, Crystal. And uh, you know, I read uh, in terms of the getting the final 310 million Africans online require us to lay over 120,000 kilometers of cable. It's almost prohibitive when you think of the cost. And there is a possibility that space-based assets might close that gap faster and cheaper than, than uh, available options. With that, we'd like to turn to the audience for, for, for questions, both the audience in the room and uh, those online, again, if you have any questions, please uh, just raise your hand and, uh, all right. Um, yes, ma'am. Hi, um, so I'm coming from New Zealand. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, visiting here from New Zealand, so representing our Pacific, and um, recently had the benefit of sitting in a meeting based over here using Starlink, because we've got numerous areas of our country that don't have capacity to have internet. Mm. Um, with our recent cyclones as well, it's been really tough, but we're not there yet. We, we don't have the funding and a lot of people don't have the finances. Um, this is a bit of a stupid question, but I'm going to ask it. Please. Um, <laughs> for someone that understands the future and the capability and what, where we need to go, how do we reassure smaller nations um, on what preparation is being made for corruption in the space arena? Mm. So how do, we, how do we know the reliance and the, um, the kind of future coalitions of certain nations aren't gonna impact us in the same way they are for a lot of our other resources? Mm. So what, what is being done, what foresight is being had to ensure that that's potentially not going to happen? Or how do, how do I reassure someone that I want to go and talk to about this from a governance point of view, um, that we're not heading in the same direction as many of our other 
um, issues of reliance and, and corruption. Mm. Thank you. Jars? Uh, and then I guess one more. And then also a, a bit of a, a, a governance question. Um, Rose, you kind of started with the fact that um, space has been, um, in a way, sort of the best of humanity. The, 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 uh, uh, there's been an immense amount of global public good created and handed out for free. Um, uh, and and you know the sort of the big question is how how, how do you how do you, um, uh, you know, take what's available for free already? So two part question: one, what created a governance regime or lack of governance regime um, that, that that meant that that space so far really has been a bit of a model of of uh, global cooperation largely, uh, and and. What does the panel think about the future? Uh, uh, is that now at risk um, it, because of new yeah, cold war, know. more commercialization, whatever? You know, uh, uh, can, can we keep that that core of of, of uh, sort of global Good. generosity going? Mm. And we take one more question, and, and then we'll go to the go to. Uh, do we have any questions from online? Just let us know if we do, so that we can be able to ask them too. But please, sir. Yeah, I think it was alluded to, uh, but. Another resource for space capability and space capacity are small businesses. Small businesses that specialize in innovation and research, mm. like ours. I'm with Stomp Center Communications. We're actually a NASA technology. NASA invested in our development of our technology. We do geospatial mapping. So our technology is aboard NASA satellites. Mm. So we map and observe the planet. We map weather. We map climate change. We map all forest fires, wildfires, uh, sea level rise. I mean, we have a, a thousand applications. And there are other companies that NASA is investing in from the small business communities that need to be leveraged. That's kind of like low-hanging fruit. We're a small business. But we're actually trying to make our technology accessible to HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, American Indian universities, to provide them with the tools to respond to the impacts of their communities. Mm. So that's a resource and a partnership that we're open to exploring, and I'm sure other businesses as well are open to exploring. Thank you, sir. I would like uh, okay, so to I'll, I'll, I'll just launch. I'll start with uh, so three super interesting questions, and I, I really appreciate it. Um, for uh, the question of alliance, corruption, how do we keep the door open? And I would say, uh, by having forums like this, by encouraging diversity and diversification of actors in space, by making sure that countries that are not technically space-faring right now understand they have equities in the space environment and that they're encouraged to participate in forums like the ITU, like the UN. Um, and uh, examples like the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, are outstanding to, to talk about and laud and aspire to. I think some of these organizations uh, quietly go about their business providing this data and support, and they don't really get credit for it. They don't really talk about it, you know? And so we just need to remember, like, this was a, a very successful cooperation that crossed many um, political orientations uh, and, and to, to a good result that impacted humanity in a positive way. At the same time, um, as we move forward with new space activity, with more, uh, more companies involved, with complicated uh, uh, groupings of countries and private actors, you know, who is in charge of X satellite? You know, how are we making sure that owner operator is um, uh, being safe and, uh, and, and not potentially putting at risk the space environments and all of these, good public, these public goods that are already in place? Um, I think that is also an imperative that we continue to talk about and think about, well, what levers does a government have to encourage for good behavior? You know, are we having deliberate conversations about standards and regulations so we don't walk into a situation where there's uh, a race to the bottom, where a country X says, no regulation, launch whatever you want, and another country has maybe very strict rules. You know, so that is not beneficial uh, to the overall good functioning of the space ecosystem. So I'd hate to say it's complex, but it is complex. We kind of <laughs> have to do everything at the same time. Um, so the better that uh, policymakers uh, are aware and understand where their interests are, the more users and civil society that are involved in advocating for us to do the right thing, I think the better that future scenario will turn out. Thank you, Rose. And now we just invite the, the panelists just to uh, pick any of the questions that 
answer to you. And, uh, sure, I can, I can jump in a little bit on the question about space has been a public good in many situations, and we're seeing that evolve. And, and I will just start off by saying that I am a firm believer in the complementary nature of the development of the commercial space sector in conjunction, in partnership, and as a, as a supplement to government-provided services. We, we can all acknowledge that PNT that weather data, that you know, that Landsat, you know, remote sensing data has spawned more value by by being open to the public. Um, from if you just want to look at the dollar figures, um, than 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 would be if, if the government were trying to sell those data. Now that said, there is there is innovation that is happening on the commercial side that I simply don't think would happen in government. And so I, I, I honestly I, I actually get a little frustrated sometimes about this. We we call, we're still having this refrain of well, why do we need to pay for data if the government already does it, or vice versa? Sometimes you hear, well, the commercial sector should develop it. Why is the government doing? It? These are exquisite instruments. We simply can't function as a society without PNT, without weather data, and without a basic understanding of how our planet is changing. And so governments should absolutely continue to invest in these long-term, large, exquisite projects that really don't belong in commercial hands. But at the same time, there are numerous capabilities that governments can then offload to the commercial sector to allow them to do other things, can encourage innovation in specific areas where the government is less interested or where there has less of a science purpose. Um, and so really, I, I'm generally um, pleased by the number of governments that sort of are working to figure out how to make that work. Um, so I, I generally think that we'll just continue to see that. But I will say a, a challenge to that issue that I see is what I see is a decreasing understanding of the value of space. Mm. Um, those of us who are in space, we get excited about it. We think it's fun. It's true around the world. We all just kind of assume everybody loves us. Um, but I'm not sure that that's the same. I don't think we do as an industry do a good job communicating the value of what these services provide. I mean, there's funny stories about how, well, why do we need to pay for government weather data? I can just check it on my phone. <laughs> because people don't understand that's working. Or how many times have we explained, well, your, your little blue dot works if you download the map, even when your cell phone service doesn't, because they're not the same. And look, not every single person needs to understand the technology. However, if we don't have the basic common understanding of where these technologies come from and why investments, both commercially and in the government, need to happen, then I am concerned we could have a problem with this as a public good moving forward. You know, not everybody's grandma needs to understand, but if nobody's grandma understands, <laughs> then we might start seeing a, redu a reduction in, in this. And, and you get a lot of, um, a lot of lack of understanding at just how deep this can go. Um, I was recently on a paper that was published looking at how space data was used to validate census data in Nigeria ahead of a, um, a vaccination campaign, therefore allowing for the actual, like, reaching the numbers they needed to to eradicate polio. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a, that, that's a, it's very different. People generally understand you can look down at the earth and maybe understand how oceans are changing. But these use cases are so much more widespread than that. And, and I would like to see more done in that area to ensure that we continue to receive these public goods. Thank you. One of the things, and I, I love that point, um, one of the things in the handbook that I talk about is you know, deciding, how do you decide what is important? And you don't have to have a space study to do that. You look at existing documents that talk about what your country's issues are. You know, so if the priority is dealing with flood zones, you know, Clearly, satellites would have an application to go to go address that particular issue, and that should be a slice of an overall effort. Um, and then, if you're looking to develop your space program, it makes sense then to maybe initiate that first project or effort or growth around that very clear problem set that already has interest and investment from the government and from the civilian population. Mm. That's how you make space capabilities real um, versus uh, this kind of like too big, too glamorous thing. And I'd say uh, sometimes, as you know, space enthusiasts, we shoot ourselves in the foot because we will roll out these beautiful slides, you know, these glossy pictures of all the stuff that space can do, um, but it becomes overwhelming or too unreal or, uh, or or impossible to do without you know a major lift. And and we have to we have to make it more normal, more grounded to local issues. I think for success, but that also speaks to uh, companies, you know, to highlight. This is a problem. Here are the foundation. We have we have a kind of foundational data sets for you to work with. Private, small companies, academia. You know, think about projects that you can apply to this problem. We as a government are interested in encouraging this to to happen. You know, mm -hmm. and that communication is so vital, both to show people why it's important and to show opportunities for engagement. 
uh, to civil society, to academia, to the private sector in order to move forward to get that positive feedback loop going. Uh, Val and I Alex. Come in. Okay. Go, go ahead, Val. Yeah, I just want to uh, link up to what Rose put on the table. When we were developing the African space policy and strategy, uh, we did an exercise of looking at the African Union Commission, and they have like eight or nine different commissions. And we took all of the objectives and we mapped it in terms of uh, reliance on space products and services. And we found that there was a 90% reliance on space products and services in terms of achieving the work of the African Union. And so that was a classic example of grounding um, the African space program in terms of the use case requirements. But I also just wanted to chime in on the, uh, the question around the small businesses, because I, I think it touches on the role of space agencies in the evolving space economy. Um, in terms of the, the space agency role and function, from where I've come from, we had to relook really at the business model and the role of the agency within the broader space ecosystem. And uh, you know the classical mode is where everything is done in house, whether it's upstream, downstream. And we had to rethink about the business model in terms of looking at the role of the agency as you know, the infrastructure is a backbone. And then you bring the industry on the upstream in terms of prime contracting them to build the satellites. And then on the downstream where you sort of archive the data in a repository and you bring in the industry uh, where they can build the products and services and you have a commercial framework. And that allows the small businesses to thrive as well. And so, you know, when you're looking at that kind of model allows the small businesses to kind of get into this sort of national uh, space value chain. And this is also very key in terms of building that national capability that's required, which links back to the, I think the very first question around um, how do we uh, ensure that there's no corruption yeah. in the sort of value chain? And I, I can give you the African context. You know, there's only two countries that have not been colonized in the past. Um, that's no more the case uh, in the modern day Africa, but we could look at technological con uh, sort of colonization in a different context. Hmm. Uh, how do some countries know more than we know what's in our own backyard? What are the mining resources? Where are the potentials, in, even in the oceans, for fisheries, as an example? Um, so there's a move in terms of building that indigenous capability, becoming intelligent users. And I think that's where the space agencies are kind of well situated to make that sort of change in terms of building that integrity, in terms of how we exploit that kind of information for our own socioeconomic development as well. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Alex? Yeah, one last quick comment because a, a, a lot was already covered. Uh, just very quickly, something that I wanted to re-emphasize on the digital public good aspect is the following. I, I think that compared to the sheer amount of data that has been made available in the 10, last 10 or 20 years, globally, the, the actual use and applications have been lagging behind, uh, generally speaking. And this is essentially, that comes back to my point about most of the people that should be using space data do not really care that it comes from space and have no interest in knowing so uh, whatsoever. So it's really, again, about building this ecosystem and this intermediary layer of brokers that will ingest this data and translate it in information that then can easily be ingested by those other players, right? And the reality is that building an ecosystem is not straightforward. Right? There is no magic formula or, or recipe for this. Uh, we certainly know what prevents an ecosystem from emerging, but we do not really know what will make it happen in the end, right? And that's, that takes a lot of uh, brainstorming, a lot of coordination, a lot of, of course, regulation first step, then coordination, then potentially investments, a lot of promotion. Uh, all those instruments need to be used together, and I think we're, we're, we're getting there, and we're uh, slowly progressing on this. Uh, and, and when it comes down to the mishandling or the misuse of, of, of the data itself, corruption and safety, I mean, there has been so many cases where this type of data has been mishandled. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of a negative externality that is sometimes hard to avoid or, or to prevent, especially because there is kind of a clash between making this data open and, and preventing anybody to use it 
for the wrong purpose, right? Uh, but this definitely needs, it's something that needs to be discussed at the national level. The regulation needs to be discussed at the national level, but as remote sensing is provided globally, in the end you'll need to have strong international and global regulation on this. And I guess there is also some progress to be made. Thank you. I, you know, I said the speakers, the, the panelists will introduce themselves when they when they spoke. That didn't happen, so I should probably just <laughs> introduce them. All right, that was uh, Alex Chenet. He's the European Space Agency representative at the World Bank. Uh, Vanathan Musami is advisor to the CEO of the Space, the Saudi Space Commission. He's chancellor of the International Space University and co-founder of the Africa Space Leadership Institute. And Crystal Azerton is director of space applications programs at uh, the Secure World Foundation. Now, we have a question from online, so we should go to that. Questions. Two questions from online. Um, the first is, what type of jobs can you see developing as part of the efforts to build the space ecosystem at an international level? Then the second question is, what are the internal and external narratives that nations developing space capabilities need to contend with to progress their space programs? Mm -hmm. We can take another question from the room and then Sir. Okay, and then Eric, we'll just uh, take that uh, question. Brendan Murray, I'm an independent consultant, currently working with Excelsior Space, but I had a question. I was wondering if you would want to get into a, a slightly deeper dive as to how some of these international partnerships and international uh, assistance, especially like the bilateral ones, um, in the past when doing this kind of research on how uh, new uh, developing uh, space programs are coming up in smaller nations, we'd see countries like China who would get into a fairly overt bilateral partnership where they would just, in helping them, in not just, it's not so much helping them develop a whole ecosystem, but it's just, hey, we will build and launch a satellite for you, maybe help you develop your ground system and gateway system, and in return, we have enhanced access to your natural resources mm. or, or oil reserves, so it's pretty one-on-one pretty -on -one there. What are some other models, because I don't think many other countries are that, that overt, there's you know, obviously a division between private sector and, and the U.S. government or, or, or other governments. So what are some other models that bilateral agreements uh, follow? What kind of, what is, is it just data sharing? Is it revenue sharing? How, how would that kind of work? Thanks. And, and we'll take one last question in the back and then we'll close with those questions. Mine is a technical question. I'm Lucy Mize. I head the health team for the Asia Bureau at USAID. And we actually do already use space data. Um, we have a, an agreement with NASA. But I'm wondering if you could enlarge my awareness. How else might we use space data in the health sector? We look at famine. We look at heat. We look at flooding, because those all have health outcomes. But what am I missing? Is there a, a way we could use space data, migration capture perhaps, that would impact our health systems? Because I always have to sell new technology with a return on investment if I try and do something innovative. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just to the panel, you can take one, or, and please, uh, as best as you can, Keep your uh, responses brief so that we I'll can... I'll try finish. very hard. I'm okay, chomping at the bit, though, because such yeah. great, question. great questions. So jobs, uh, yes, of course. Uh, the, the first answer usually is, like, train a bunch of aerospace engineers and you'll have a space program, and I will say that is wrong. <laughs> you really need to bring in uh, the health expert. You need to bring in those lawyers. You need to bring in people who have other expertise into the space community as well if you're going to build a healthy space ecosystem. So it does include onboarding, uh, onboarding new people through the education system from kindergarten through university, but also welcoming and having a path on board for all of those people who are already professionals or are looking to get into, into this community. So um, uh, the, 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 uh, I could probably spend another 20 minutes talking about the range of possibilities. In the handbook, I do talk about different types of jobs that, um, that, that a country needs to specifically cultivate to support their space ecosystem that may not be already kind of lying around, you know? Um, but then I also do strongly talk about welcoming these other uh, uh, professions into the fold. Um, for internal versus external issues, um, probably the closest thing on this is, is the uh, discussion on um, you know, space or hunger. Do, do we deal with those immediate concrete problems um, that we have, to, we, we, we have to maybe provide direct food aid? Um, or do we invest in this longer term infrastructure thing that is harder to grasp the utility of? 
And I'd say you know, space should be thought about as infrastructure. So just as you'd have the same conversation about roads or electricity, you should also think about space infrastructure. Mm. You, don't, you, you use roads to be able to move goods and services and maybe aid faster, better, more directed to a population. Um, if you didn't have that road, it'd be a lot harder to provide that aid. And space drive data, communications, uh, position navigation and timing data have you know, parallel types of utilities. Mm. So it just needs to be just as a big just, right? It needs to be mm. balanced with, with all of these requirements. And communication is super important. So people don't perceive you know, your investment in space as you know, yanking bread out of somebody's mouth. You know, it has to be explained like why these things are connected. So that communication piece is really essential. Um, I think bilateral relationships uh, are a, an important ingredient to an overall plan about how to build capability. And no country should be too reliant necessarily on Same one plan. path only. You know, keep you know, multiple eggs in the basket. Um, and several countries that have established space capabilities have worked with various partners. And I think that is, I think that is healthy. Um, some, some, country, some, some companies, some countries have a, a little bit more of a defined path to do this kind of partnership capability. I think the UK, especially with Surrey, has um, you know kind of a history of you know being part of their business model to support uh, capability capacity building or basic space capabilities. And I think other companies are doing versions of that as well. Um, and I think you're going to see a, a wide spectrum of approaches um, from China to the United States to Europe to Brazil or Africa or Mexico. You know, all all of these regions, all of these countries have a little. They're, they're, they each have their own approach and, and priorities. Um, and I think the important thing to do is come to the table um, with you know, having, having an independent idea of what your needs are and what your interests are, and some awareness of avoiding traps, like becoming too overly dependent or being concerned about maybe security implications of you know, investing in one particular entity for all of your telecommunications or being too vertical from from hardware all the way up to operations and, and you know, to include uh, that last mile to end users. So um, th that would be my general device, advice. And uh, for the health sector, um, uh, I, have, I have dreamt about having a workshop specifically for the work sector. Bringing, I would love to see um, a group of space experts, people who, who really understand spectrum and all the various creative ways you can use it to extract data against you know, what are the top five problems that you know, health organization X is trying to get after to see if we can tease out some new approaches. Because it does require a, a cross-disciplinary um, coming together, I think, for a, a really a good result um, to, to find new opportunities. Thank you, Rose, and the rest of the panels. Any, any of the questions? I'll jump in very quickly, Alex. Um, especially on the health question. Uh, so. As you can imagine, at the World Bank, we've also been thinking about this a lot. Um, I think some of the topics we were mentioning about uh, heat, for example, you know, urban heat islands, uh, or air pollution, water quality are also, of course, top important topics we've been thinking about. Lately, we've been trying to think about the use of, of Earth observation in the, with the one health paradigm, right? So trying to see how this can be used when you analyze health as a connection between human health ecosystem health and livestock health. And typically, uh, one topic we are studying right now is how urbaniz um, urbanization-driven deforestation can drive the emergence of uh, epidemics and pandemics and how we can try to track this kind of deforestation uh, to better approach the potential emergence of an epidemic in certain regions of the world. So happy to take a conversation on the side on, on this specific topic. When it comes to bilateral, um, bilateral relations regarding uh, like the building of space capabilities. Uh, following up on, on what Rose was mentioning, I, I think it, it has been happening a lot in, in European countries and for example for a country like France through CNES, which is the French Space Agency in a sense, uh, through potentially technical assistance to, to African countries, right? What is important here is that it's very much driven by domestic interest and historical uh, historic relationships between those different countries, right? So it's, it's kind of a different angle to what the European Space Agency would have. But I think that has been crucial for those countries to build those space capabilities. I'll stop here. Crystal? Sure. So great questions. On the workforce question, I will say um, space takes a lot of different 
different types of people. Um, and you, you want to look at what you already have in country. Um, geospatial and GIS is actually an incredibly popular major across Africa, across Latin America. There is an actually a stronger in-house capability for the analytics of space in emerging space nations than there sometimes are in developed space nations where there's a shortage of those capabilities. Mm. Um, but also space needs policy experts, space needs project managers, space needs marketing people, it needs toolists and diasts and I mean it's really broad. So I, I actually think you want to start to a certain extent with what you already have and, and, and look at how you can make the developing space sector attractive to outside experts who can contribute. Um, on the internal and external narratives, Rose touched on some really great stuff. I think I would throw in, there's often a debate between those who look at space for national prestige and those who are looking at the development of space capabilities for economic growth and those who are looking at the development of space capabilities for actual um, applications like we've been talking about today. And all of those are legitimate reasons and frankly will all likely play into internal dialogues. Mm. But as you develop a space strategy and whatever that ends up looking like, I actually think you have to address all of those. And Rose lays out a lot of those um, considerations in the handbook. And so I, I just think that it's really important to think about the different constituencies within a country are gonna have very different interests. Um, and this applies because we haven't really touched on this, but exploration comes up a lot as countries are thinking about that. And exploration and ex meeting exploration goals, being part of bilateral or um, large groups to contribute to you know, the International Space Station or exploration of the moon or these other much larger activities um, can look very different for different types of countries, but can still be very inspirational. And so all of those are things that need to be considered. Um, on the health front, the, and, and since we're at the Center for Global Development, I will actually say I think it's incredibly encouraging. Um, I worked with MIT Media Labs back in 2020 to actually do a series where we picked out the less talked about um, SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and we did a series of webinars with experts from each of those to kind of tease out what your question is. So health was one of them we looked at. Uh, so we didn't do oceans, we didn't do agriculture. We really wanted to look, and we did one on democracy and governance, one on monitoring evaluation, one on health, one on food. Um, and we really tried to look at some of that. So I incorporate interest anyone who wants to hear a little bit more about some of those kind of industry specifics to take a look at that series um, and reach out to the experts because there really are people thinking very deeply about those exact questions. Mm. Bab, we give you the final word. Okay, great. Thanks, Gary. Uh, just two maybe interventions, one on the health issue uh, in question. I think the true value of uh, geospatial information comes to the fore when we start to marry that with in situ data, so mm -hmm. data that's on the ground essentially. So when you do that, you bring, in, bring out a richness of data um, in, in terms of information that you can use in terms of the any aspect, including health. And I think where we're going at the moment, if you look at how these constellations of satellites are coming through and getting near real-time data coming through, you're moving from forecasting into the future to now casting. Uh, in, you know, if you think of satellite imagery, it's systematic coverage on a daily basis. So you can do change detection almost immediately with artificial intelligence and so on. So you can now start to identify certain triggers in terms of health issues and so on. So I think that's a, a real pregnant potential that we should start looking at from the, the health perspective. And not only health, but many other applications. Just in terms of the international bilateral structure, um, I think there's two pathways in terms of building ecosystem. You have to look at it from the national interest point of view. So the two pathways is either transformational, where you build the capabilities from inside of the country, or transactional, where you buy the capabilities into the country. And you've got to find a fine balance. You can't over rely on the transactional, where you're buying the capabilities in, or too much on the transformational if you're in a hurry as well. So you've got to find the balancing point, and there's very different uh, modalities of doing that. So, for example, I'll give you one example with the uh, you know, an India, Brazil, South Africa kind of relationship, where instead of relying on the bigger partner, how do we build a satellite? One country provides a satellite bus, another the payload, and another can do the launch. So those are the kinds of modalities you need to sit down and discuss in terms of an equal benefit, mutual benefit essentially coming through through some of the collaboration. And there's many different examples of that as well. Um, stop there. Thank you.
Thank you, Val. Uh, Rose has done an incredible service here with this manual. I was talking to a friend of mine who had seen in the news that uh, two African countries were considering space agencies, and she uh, scoffed at what seemed like a frivolous use of really, really vi uh, valuable resources because she was thinking uh, SpaceX. <laughs> but uh, th the manual provides us an opportunity for where to start. It could be one person. It could be an office. Could, how to use it? And and she, you know, Rose makes this really good point about grounding it in a use case that is applicable that people can see direct benefits from being able to do it. So Rose is going to be available. Sign your books if you want a copy of it. Um, thanks to everybody who's been here today to our panelists. Please uh, uh, give them a hand of. Uh, <laughs>